Good morning. Welcome to service here at Wyoming Valley Presbyterian Church. We're very happy to have so many of you joining us today, both in person and virtually. For those of you who are at home, I hope you were able to find some palms. And for those of you here, I hope you have all of your palms in hand or nearby. Because throughout the service, as we sing our hymns, you'll see there's specific times when you're instructed to wave your palms. For instance, during the first hymn, it'll be during the refrain of that hymn. So during the refrain, wave your palms, make a good time of it, really celebrate our Lord and Savior today on this Palm Sunday. And of course, the celebration in worship doesn't just start and end today. We have an entire holy week of that. This coming Thursday at 6 p.m., we'll have our Maundy Thursday service right here in the sanctuary, which is always a good time of reflection, a time to understand what holiness truly means in our lives. And we'll end with a Tanambre service, which is always dramatic and meaningful. And then on Good Friday, I would like to invite you all to an ecumenical service at St. Stephen's, where I will be preaching. This congregation and all of our neighboring congregations are invited to join us. It will be at St. Stephen's on Good Friday at noon. And then, of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and it's always a fantastic time to be in the house of the Lord on Easter Sunday. So we invite you then to come and worship with us and keep this week holy. We have a few announcements. <clears throat> After service today, we have our breakfast with the Easter Bunny and our egg hunt. They are kind of a combined event. So if any of you are feeling your inner child today, please come join us. Get a picture with the Easter Bunny. Come join us and uh, hunt for some eggs and hopefully get some prizes. We're going to be hunting for eggs downstairs today. It's a little too cold to keep all our little ones outside while they go searching. If you have any questions, see me after service. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a reminder that today is the day to pick up your peanut butter and coconut eggs. Uh, please see me in uh, Fowler Hall after breakfast uh, to get those if you ordered. If you didn't order, you're in luck because we have extras and we have a lot of them. So we are doing a, a little sale of sorts, uh, two bags for $15 as opposed to $10 a piece. Uh, we do have all four kinds still available, peanut butter, uh, with milk chocolate, peanut butter with dark chocolate, coconut with milk chocolate, and coconut with dark chocolate. Uh, so please see me after breakfast if you're interested in supporting that fundraiser. And also just wanted to point out that Church Assets will have our next meeting on Sunday, April 7th uh, at approximately 1130 uh, in the conference room. Thank you. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation this morning? I just want to give a special thank you to all of the elders and deacons who came out to our retreat yesterday. It was a good time of camaraderie, faith formation, and we even had some fun and some snacks as well. So next time that we do have that, I want to invite all of you to come join us, even if you're not an elder or deacon, but if you're curious what it means to be in ordered ministry. A minute for mission for one great hour of sharing. <clears throat> How do we heal the brokenness and fear in the world when it seems so widespread? How can we share hope in a world that is so conflicted? Our political brokenness, our cultural brokenness, the brokenness of our climate, even the brokenness between and among religious communities. That is not to mention the brokenness we feel in our own lives and the lives of those we know and love. <clears throat> Physical and emotional and yes, even spiritual brokenness. All of that brokenness coupled with the fear, fear of the unknown, of the future. So how? Brokenness is a human condition, but it is not acceptable to God so it should not become acceptable to us. 
In Isaiah 58, God, through the voice of the prophet, calls us to be repairers of the breach. For Isaiah, the primary breach was between God and God's people. That breach takes on human form in oppression, injustice, hunger, homelessness, and disease. Isaiah 58, which culminates in one great hour of sharing theme, is a veritable litany of how we are called to repair brokenness. Note what we are called to do, shout, announce, humble, clothe, shelter, and share. We are called to repair brokenness by putting our faith in action, pray, welcome, restore, hear, work, and give. That action can look like many things, offering shelter in the face of natural disaster, providing economic support in the face of poverty, and providing food in the face of hunger. If we answer the call to be repairers of the breach, we will, by God's grace, be led into a new season of justice, freedom, and peace. For when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Thank you. And now let us move from getting here to being here as we come together for a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we enter Holy Week, we ask that you strengthen us to move beyond the festive parades of palms and follow Jesus all the way to the cross. That being united with him in a death like his, we might one day be united with him in a resurrection like his. So we might enter the gates of the righteous city in heaven and praise your holy name all our life long. Amen. Please stand for our call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he.
The Lord God is our helper. Therefore, we have not been disgraced by the mark of sin in our lives. Scripture tells us that we will not be put to shame, for our Redeemer is near. And if it is the Lord God who helps us, who can declare us guilty? So, with confidence in God's redeeming love, let us confess our sins before God and one another. God of all mercy, you sin. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We have been misled of our pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love. We have neglected justice and ignore your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ our Savior. Please be seated for a time of reflection. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Because of the all-sufficient grace that we have received in baptism, we have nothing to fear. We are God's chosen people, forgiven and freed. I declare you, in the name of the Most High God, that you are forgiven. Give thanks and be at peace. and the love of our Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let us receive one another with the peace of Christ. All right, friends, I would like to invite all of my children and children at heart to come on up. I've got some Pez for you today if you want to join me. Children at heart are welcome. <laughs> So friends, uh, thank you for passing the Pez, the peace with me. I want you to think about things that have been happening lately. We've had a lot of parades lately, right? Have you, did you go to any of the parades for St. Patrick's Day? Did you watch any on TV? Have any parade ever on TV? Thanksgiving, Christmas, there's parades all the time, right? What are they for? What do you think? What do we do at parades? We celebrate the holidays. Beautiful. Did you know that we used to have parades for important people that come to town? Can you imagine it? You're the super important person, right? You're the mayor. And you're coming to a new town, 
and they throw a parade for you. Have you seen the movie Aladdin? With the genie, flying on the magic carpet? If you have, maybe you remember when he wished he was Prince Ali. And he has a parade to come into town to meet Jasmine. What kinds of things do you remember seeing in that parade? The monkey was definitely there, right? Do you remember what he turned into? Really big animal with a big trunk. He turned into an elephant. Can you imagine riding into town on an elephant? Do you think that people would just go about their day cleaning their laundry, doing their dishes, and you're there riding on an elephant through the streets? Do you think they would ignore you? No. What if you just kind of walked through the streets? Do you think they might ignore you then? So if you were super important, you'd get a bigger animal. If you were super important, you might have so much money that you would just start throwing it into the streets. Kind of like what we do with the candy and the little trinkets, the necklaces and all those things on real parades. Well, Palm Sunday is the day we celebrate Jesus. What do you think his parade looked like? Make a guess. A cross? He wasn't quite at the cross yet. That comes Friday. You're close, though. Look in between you. What do you think was there at his parade? Friends, palms. Palm Sunday. They wave the palms. They put it down like a carpet. Imagine Jesus just walking right through this. But that's all he had. He rode in on a little baby donkey and had some palms on the ground. Do you think that the people thought he was really important? No, because you get a big animal. You get lots of stuff if you're important. But we know better. Jesus is important. And when we go downstairs for Children's Chapel, we're going to hear a little bit more about why, and our friends here are going to learn about why with Pastor Adam. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, you don't have to repeat, just listen. Dear Lord, please remind us that your way is the best way, even when it seems strange and not important.
Please join me in saying our prayer for illumination. Holy One of Israel, open your mouth and speak your word to us this morning. Pour out your spirit of grace upon us, that we may faithfully journey to the cross. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from the 118th Psalm, verses 1 through 2 and 19 through 29. Hear now the word of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them with me, and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. <clears throat> For the Lord is God. He has given us light and the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our final reading for this Palm Sunday comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning on verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival, that had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His followers did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they had heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, See, you can do nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. The word of the Lord. Today is Palm Sunday. If you haven't figured that out already. A day in the biblical narrative when hope rode into town and took center stage. And this wasn't just any hope. This was revolutionary hope, heavenly hope, eternal hope, hope that promises new life. We're told in the preceding verses that this happened during the Passover festival, which is a really important celebration in the life of the Israelites. And it was an even bigger deal in the life of Jerusalem. So we can be sure that all of the rulers and all of the big wigs of the region were in town for the festival. In fact, we're told that it was the custom of the people to go out to the city gates and celebrate the arrival of all of these visiting dignitaries. And you better believe it was certainly the custom of the rulers to make a big, grand entrance. King Herod, who usually did his best to stay away from Jerusalem, even he had to be in town for the festivities. And we knew that he was quite wealthy. 
So you can just imagine that grand spectacle of him arriving into town with all of his riches being paraded through the city gates. All of the prized animals, silken garments, flowers, spices, servants, soldiers, musical instruments, and everything that shined and shimmered, Herod was sure to make a great spectacle. Even Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, who hated Jerusalem and usually preferred to stay on the coast in Caesarea, even he had to be in town for the celebration. In fact, it was particularly important that Pilate be at the, the, the celebration because Passover was a celebration of the liberation of the Hebrews from the oppression of Pharaoh. Pilate knew that the zealots would use this as an opportunity to protest their oppression under Caesar. And it was no secret that Pilate detested the zealots. So when he rode into town through those city gates, he was sure to demonstrate his power. We know from the historical record that the Roman procession it was always a dramatic spectacle. First through the city gates would come the great golden statue of the Roman eagle being held up high on a pole. Then came the trumpeters and the soldiers and the cavalry and the terrifying heavily armed chariots. And usually at the end of this long parade there would be a group of chained prisoners being dragged behind it all. I wouldn't be surprised if Pilate even had a few leftover zealots from last year's protests in tow as well, just for good measure. So when Herod and Pilate came parading into town, one with the symbols of wealth and the other with the symbols of power, what they were saying to the people was, this is why we're in charge. We have everything that's important in life, and you do not. Herod and Pilate were both addicted to collecting all of the money and all of the power that they could get their hands on. Herod was a puppet king of Caesar, and Pilate was Caesar's political appointee, which meant that they used all of their time and effort to try to get more and more power from Caesar and from their people. And it's not hard to see if you look around our world today that Pilate and Herod are still parading around. And as, high, parrot, uh, as Pilate and Herod parade up and down the streets of our society today, through our news feeds and across the pages of our social media, what they're telling us is that we should want more, that we should strive for more, that we should strive to make our own dreams come true, strive to make your life more comfortable, strive to protect yourself from an unknown future, and strive to control those around you. They tell us that we should strive, strive, and keep on striving until you have all that you want in this life. But the truth is that it's never going to be enough. Wealth and power, when hoarded, are narcotics. And with any narcotic, the more you have, the more you crave. And you'll spend every waking hour worried that you will never have enough. And even with all of their striving for more wealth and more power, in the end, how does the world remember Herod and Pilate? We remember them as the crucifiers of Christ, the world's only real help. They killed the man who warned us that one day your soul will be required of you, and all of these things that you have collected, then whose will they be? There are so many reasons to be afraid that you won't have enough in life. 
and there are so many uncertainties about the future. So then, how are we supposed to get over this great fear that makes us addicted to wealth and to power? How do we stop striving for more and start striving for that which is enough? Well, one year in Jerusalem, there was a third parade. The parade of Jesus of Nazareth, the revolutionary who had performed some pretty amazing miracles, including raising Lazarus from the dead. And the Gospel writer John makes it very clear that the crowds showed up to meet Jesus precisely because they had heard that he brought Lazarus back to life. Here was a man that could raise the dead, which is what we need. It's our only hope in life if we're ever going to get over our addictions to wealth and power because we were killing ourselves trying to save ourselves. And the whole reason we began to chase after wealth and power in the first place was because we thought that with them, somehow we'd be able to prevent our loss of dreams, our loss of health, our loss of happiness, and everything else that makes up life. But the message of Jesus is that in order to get over your fear of losing your life, you don't strive for more, rather you die to that life that you already have. Only then are you able to receive the amazing gift of new life in Christ. Cheap grace, uh, according to theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer, is a grace that doesn't bid you to come and die. Whereas costly grace asks for everything. It asks for your money, your power, your dreams, your family, your sense of control. It bids you to come and give it all up. Give it to Jesus so that you can discover a whole new life. One that's finally free of striving for more. Otherwise, you're going to waste your entire life worrying about losing the things that you were never going to be able to keep in the first place. Now trust me on this next part, because I actually sat down and did the math, which is rare for me. But in my calculations, images eventually come to an end. And 100% of people born on this earth will eventually die. You're not going to beat those odds. No matter how much wealth or power you have, whatever it is that you're afraid of losing, you will lose. So then why would you want to waste your life worrying about something that's just going to happen anyway? Just get it over with. Choose this day to die to your old life so that you might be raised to new life on Easter morning. Then you'll finally be free enough to live. John tells us that when Jesus heard about the plot to kill him, he went out into the wilderness with his disciples where he was safe. Meanwhile, everyone was wondering if he would actually come into Jerusalem for the Passover, since there was a warrant out for his arrest. So on Palm Sunday, when he arrived at the city gates, he came parading into town as a fugitive revolutionary. Crowds knew this. So when they saw him, they began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now in true Jesus fashion, he wanted to make sure that they understood that he wasn't some conquering king such as Herod or Pilate or some other visiting dignitary. So according to John, Jesus went and found a small donkey to ride into town. John even tells us that it was a young donkey, a, a little donkey. 
read, not impressive here. It was a non-impressive animal. What kind of a conquering king, a king of Israel, rides into town on a little donkey? Where's all of the pageantry, all of the intrigue and the displays of power and wealth like Herod and Pilate? What kind of a king rides a donkey into town? Only one who's free. That's who. By riding into town in such a way, Jesus is dem demonstrating that he's free from the addictions to power and wealth, and that he's even free from the expectations of the crowd. And I'll tell you, there's nothing more addictive than the praise of a crowd. Every morning when you climb out of bed, you face a crowd of expectations. There's a crowd at work, a crowd at home, a crowd at school, there's even a crowd at the church. The crowd is so compelling because they tell you that they need you, that they're counting on you, that it's up to you to give them what they want. If you can just give them what they want, well, they'll be really happy with you. They might even lift you up on their shoulders and parade you around while chanting your name, but only if you give them what they want. The truth is that we've all fallen for the desires of the crowd because it feels so good to be admired. We really want to be well-liked. So now, in addition to wealth and power, we can add popularity to our list of dangerous narcotics. This is where Jesus becomes our example. Because he was free, even from the people that he came to serve. He had already died to every fear and rejection that the world uses to intimidate its leaders. And that's the kind of revolutionary hope that the world needs. That's what we're celebrating today. Seeing this, the Pharisees looked to each other and said, see, you can do nothing. The world has already gone after him. What this text is telling us is that you cannot make a difference in this sin-sick world of addiction if you yourself are still addicted. But if you're willing to die to your old self, if you're willing to give up your addiction to wealth and power and popularity, then and only then will you be able to say that you've been made fully alive in Christ. And then you're ready for Easter morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We pray that you would help us with our addiction to so many things and free us in Christ so we might free enough to live. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now let us stand and affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the rose, he rose in from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
may be seated. We want to hear from you at this point in the service, your celebrations, your concerns, whatever we can do to keep you in prayer, please share it with us today. I'm asking prayer for my Uncle Jack's family. He passed away on Wednesday. Let us pray. Holy God, on this Palm Sunday, we offer our hearts in prayer and joyful thanksgiving to your mighty name. We pray for the peace and welfare of your people all over this earth. Enable our work and worship to bring understanding and reconciliation that transforms enemies into friends and neighbors into family. Bring an end to violence and bloodshed and unite us in the atoning blood of Christ. We pray for all who suffer with sickness, disease, loneliness, anger, or depression. Remind us of our afflictions and our fears that they were met with healing in Christ, that we were made new again. Bring us into your comforting presence and give us peace for our souls. We pray for the goodness of the earth and all the beauty that you've created. We pray that it may flourish with flowering, beautiful flowers, with flowing waters and healthy creatures. Lord, lead us down paths of caring for your creation and remind us of our responsibility that we have to the land that we inhabit. Holy God, you are our hope and our strength, our light and our way, our shepherd and our savior. With all of the saints in heaven and on earth, we praise your holy name using the words your son taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. God has given us his only beloved child, Jesus Christ, that, we, that he might become our salvation. With hearts full of thanksgiving, let us rejoice by giving generously to God's mission, just as God has given to us. for the great deeds of salvation that you have done and continue to do. We ask that you bless this offering of thanksgiving that it might further your kingdom in this world. Through Jesus Christ we pray.
go from here in joyful celebration, for the revolutionary has arrived. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you.